All right. Well, Mr. Kennedy, take it away. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming today and having me virtually there with you guys. So, like I said, I wish I could have been there with you in person, but uh, this, this is second best. So the idea that we're going to focus on today, and I'll switch to my screen and code, and we're going to write a lot of code during the next hour, is this idea of writing Pythonic code. And what is Pythonic code anyway? So this idea of Pythonic code really is how do we embrace how Python is meant to be as much as possible, right? You will see a lot of people come into Python, and because it's easy to learn, they'll sort of not spend too much time learning the nuances of the language, and they'll just take their algorithm, move it over, drop some semicolons, get the thing to run, and you know, long as long as it runs, it's it's kind of good, right? But there's a lot of richness in the Python language if you're if you look into it, as I know many of you guys have. And so, what we're going to do is look at. I think I have eight examples picked out. Some of them are kind of getting started type things. Some of them are fairly advanced, and it kind of covers a whole spectrum. So without further introduction, let me just switch over, and we'll just write some code around that. And then, based on how much time we have, we'll come back and we'll look at some examples and, and slides and things like that. But I prefer to write code rather than just point you guys at slides, especially, especially if we're doing this over, uh, over video screen sharing. Okay. So you should see like a velvety apple. Now, what I've done is I've created a GitHub repo for you, and I'll share that link with you shortly. And I've gone and downloaded it right here. So this is popping to my other monitor. So over here, the idea is we've got a, a couple of examples. These are our eight examples that we're going to go through. And I want to open these in, I'm going to use PyCharm. You could use any editor you want. There's nothing, uh, nothing fancy about PyCharm or required about it, really. So let me open this up, and we'll just sort of go uh, from beginning to end. And you guys can apparently see my LinkedIn notifications if you're curious. <laughs> <laughs> so fine. All right. Um, now, the first thing that actually I kind of skipped there, which I think it's not quite as easy as it could be, let's go ahead and start by doing something that a lot of people don't necessarily start with, but I think it, <clears throat> excuse me, it's, it's always a good idea. And that is to start with a virtual environment. So over here, let's go to my desktop. And I want to go to this right meetup here. And let's just create a virtual environment. So we'll say Python 3-M, VENV, and on certain versions of PyCharm, intersected with certain versions of Python on Mac, there can be this, ver this sort of symbolic link issue. So you throw a dash dash copies to make sure that it works. And of course, a directory name.env. <laughs> All right, so uh, if I had done that first, PyCharm would automatically detect that, but let's go over here and pick that really quick. Uh, it's a project, interpreter. Let's go and add a local one. Uh, not quite. This thing is uh, super uh, not responsive. Okay, there we go. Desktop. EV Ben. Okay, so all of this, as you can see right here, is going to be in Python 3. Uh, I think most of it will apply to Python 2 if you happen to still be doing Python 2. I hope that you guys are thinking of moving away. Um, maybe show of hands, I can only see like half the room, but how many of you are doing Python 3? Everyone. Beautiful. Well done, guys. And uh, as you probably know, Python 2 is going to go unsupported and unmaintained in just about two years. It's unclear what the actual day of the year, but it, in 2020, that's going to happen. So, okay, so we're going to run with our virtual environment here. And we're going to look at eight different topics. We're going to talk about uh, string formatting, which sounds kind of boring, but there's some pretty cool stuff that just recently came out in Python 3.6 that we'll, we'll touch on. Uh, some work with dictionaries, tuples, uh, return values, functions, multiple return values, uh, error handling, all sorts of stuff like that. Lambdas, generators, um, comprehensions, and we'll close it out with this concept of slots, which I think is fairly 
fairly unknown, but quite powerful in the right place. So let's just start with like some really, really simple stuff. Um, we'll begin with just some variables like name. My name is Michael and I can say my age, which if I'm right, I think I'm 44. Last time I checked. And we can come over here and we can just say, print out things like, hi there, name plus I, you know, I see you are plus age years old. We're gonna assume the person is at least more than one year old, so you don't have to deal with one year old. All right, so if we go and we run this, right click and just say run that. You see obviously it's unhappy. It is running in our virtual environment, Python 3, but it says no, no, this is a string. So we could fix this, come down here and we could say obviously this is not a string. So we could sort of throw that to the string initializer constructor and it would work, but this is super, super not Pythonic. All right, this is bad. So there's some other things that we could do. We could come down here and we could do, let's say the, the Python 2 style. We could have a percent %s and a percent. It's hard to see around this big mic. Percent. Um, name, age, right, we get the same thing. But this is kind of old school. You don't get, you know, this is not really the, the new, the hot way. So we could come along here, we could say something like this. Actually, just duplicate that line. So we come down here and say curly curly, curly curly dot format. And then we're starting to get to nicer things, right? So these should all be equivalent, except I uh, didn't type my curlies right. There we go. So these are all equivalent, right? And we can do cool stuff like if you were really old, we could put format stuff in here. So if I was like 4,400 years old, it would do like comma separators and things along these ways. But let's go a little farther. Let's suppose we have a, a dictionary, we'll just call it data, and it has this information in it. Like so, throw some colons on this, maybe a comma for good measure. We could go down here, we could actually give these names and that would, would be great. So we could come down here and say, you know, this is name, and this is age, and instead we could pass the, di the data dictionary. Okay, I think we can pass this. So we run this, uh, no, 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 no. We can pass it like double star, sorry. So we could unpack that to keyword arguments like this. And what am I still doing here? I think you need to quote your properties. What's that? I think you need to quote your property names. Not there. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. That's what the error is, yeah. I mean, I've been doing so much JavaScript. It's making me... <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. I would rather not. Okay, yeah, so perfect. Um, it works like this. And uh, yeah, I don't think it would work without. You got to unpack it to keyword arguments. So that's really good. Now, the last thing that I kind of want to touch on, like I said, this is just this is the warm-up one here, is if we have our name and our age above, let me comment this out so there's no confusion about these here. We got our name and our age above. We come down here and we could write the same basic thing. Let me just grab this. And we could take away this format, All right? There's no format here. And notice we have name here and we have age. Let me get rid of that because that won't work what I'm about to do. We just put an F. Show of hands, how many guys are familiar with these F strings? Ah, oh, okay, there's something to learn here, excellent. So what the deal is, yeah, awesome. So if you say F, this, the stuff between curlies becomes Python expressions that capture the local data that's in scope. So if I run this, um, let's put capital high just so it's obvious which one that is. That last one, it's exactly the same, right? Except for the comma separator bit isn't there. But I could go down here, I could say dot, look at this, you get autocomplete for this because this is literally the name variable and I could just call something like upper on it or something like that. Now if I run it, you can see, hi there, Michael, you're 4,400 years old. So these F strings are super, super cool and this is um, Python 3.6 only. And I do a lot of work on Ubuntu servers and I was super glad to see that they just upgraded to Python 3.6. I can now put this in production code and not just <laughs> stuff I run locally. Uh, I actually took down my website once by shipping some code like this and actually 
it turns out it's not supported by the 3.5. <laughs> it wasn't actually in the main thing, but it was in like a little side project and there was like a scanning that happened on all the directories. It wasn't good. But if you don't know this, this is like a really concise way to sort of replace this format stuff where you can not just say the name, not the, the name of the variable that goes here, but you can actually, you know, just create little Python expressions, right? So um, I guess we could, I'm not sure I'd recommend this, but we could say this, we could say, um, something like, here's the age, if age is one, else, actually, uh, that's gonna need to be single quotes, isn't it? Else, years, I, obviously this is a horrible idea, don't do this. But, <laughs> but just, to, just to show you, right, you put these little expressions in here, whoops. Uh, just come over here, run, it says years, if I make that the top, I make it one, you're one year old, right? So these are like rich Python expressions. Again, don't do this. <laughs> but, but this stuff I think is pretty cool, right? You get these little check-ins, um, the formatting you can test, and you know, maybe it's even some way a little bit more unit testable. Okay, questions, comments? I know that one's pretty, uh, pretty uh, like warm it up for us type of stuff. All right. So let's go on to dictionaries. Like I said, we'll come back and review this and look at some uh, alternative cases in a little bit. So something you have to do a lot in the web, something you have to do a lot in data science, basically anything in Python, you have to work with dictionaries, right? And as you guys pointed out, you have to quote them when you create them. So <laughs> quote the keys. So if you're going to put them together, there's a couple of interesting ways. There's really obvious ways, and there's entirely non-obvious but super slick ways. So let's imagine for a minute that we're in like a web environment, okay? And like I said, this works just as well in data science or anywhere, but imagine that somebody's doing a HTTP post, and they're gonna do it against the URL, um, let's say store slash order slash one, okay? order item one and then the body is something like name is Michael credit card is whatever right so when this happens there's different and let's say um, source equals um, add I don't know whatever these different pieces of data appear in web frameworks in different locations this one right here might come from the routing so we'd have something like ID is one, and let's just say something like action is order. And in the query string, that might be source is some kind of advertisement, right? And in the body, we might have something like this. Well, a lot like this with quotes. Right, and it could be even that maybe the post also has an ID, and maybe they're not even the same. This is seven. All right, so if we want to sort of create a, a single source of truth for our web action at the store to go, well, what is the ID? What's their name? What's their ordering? Things like that. It'd be nice to just merge this all into one dictionary. And so there's this non-Pythonic way where we could literally just loop over these. So for k comma comma v in a route, we'll say merged of k equals v, and you just duplicate this, right? Because we did that in Java, so we do it like this way, and we do this post. All right, and then if we print this out, it should have those pieces of information there. So let's change which one is running, run that. Uh, too many values to unpack. Um, I think I need, is that values? No, items. Okay, so here we've created our, our sort of thing that we can ask. What was the ID? What was the order? And notice that we got seven. And that's because the last one we did was post. Maybe we want the route to be the final source of truth. So route, we'll put at the end. Right? That's like literally, <clears throat> excuse me, what was in the URL. Whereas the other stuff, that's kind of, uh, you know, more user, they can mess with it 
dev tools, whatever. All right, so now we can see that ID is one. Okay, great. So this is how you might do this if you were, you know, just coming from some language. I mean, already this sort of tuple unpacking is pretty sweet and you might not get that, right? You probably would get the item, say dot key, dot value, or whatever, right? But still the idea is the same. So there's a better way, as you may know. So here we're resetting it. And we could say something like this, just merge dot update and give it the things. We went with query first and then we went with post and then we went with route. Now if we run it, that should be, as you can see, the second one is the same. All right, that's cool. And somehow they end up being the same order, which is not guaranteed, but there they are. Okay, so the last one, you guys obviously, I'm sure you know these two, but this last one is new and interesting. As you can see, it's only three, five and above. Now, over here, as we sort of saw before in this example, you can go to and from keyword arguments using this star star item, right? Like if I have a function and it has um, star star kw args, right? We can call it with like fun <clears throat> name equals Michael, um, let's say ID equals seven, whatever, All right? Here's the KW args, All right? So this star star lets us go either to and from uh, dictionaries. So with that in mind as inspiration, we could come over here and we could say we wanted query first and then post and then route. So we could say star star query comma star star uh, post star star uh, route like that. And it's one super simple line. We can create this sort of built up dictionary of these other ones. Cool, right? All right, well, let me prove it works. There you go. <laughs> now, now you might like it better, right? So, so this is a really cool thing we can do with dictionaries. And dictionaries are super pervasive in Python, right? Anytime you have a class, the container is the dictionary, right? Dunderdict and all those sort of things, self dot, whatever, that is coming in and out of the dictionary. Cool, questions, comments? Um, well, I just wanted to say that we have that dictionary merge in our code at the University of Richmond, and the dictionaries have several thousand entries, and it works great. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, the dictionaries never cease to amaze me how ridiculously fast they are. It's like they just defy <laughs> all, all reasonable computational power. Um, yeah. So def definitely cool. And yeah, like I, like I agree with you that these go really, really quickly. Um, uh, just, you know, I'll, I'll give you one quick example. If you go to talkpython.fm or the training site that I have, it's got a little search thing up here, right? This search thing has a JSON API running a web service. And if you come over here and you search for, say, um, let's say dictionary, right? And you do a search for this. It's searching um, megs and megs and megs of text in half a millisecond over a web service. And that's just dictionaries of dictionaries. It's, yeah, dictionaries are, are like truly amazing. Okay, so let's go on to tuples. Uh, go over here, next, our next example. So I ran it, it does nothing yet, because it's empty. So we're gonna do a couple of uh, interesting things here, right? So. I suspect most of you have worked with tuples. Um, no, no big news there. So we can have a tuple, let's suppose it's some kind of measurement uh, and it's gonna be like an X value, let's say this 0 0.4, 0 0.9, like a, a one to one, zero to one, zero to one X value. It's gonna have like a quality of zero to five of the, the quality and then the actual measurement, maybe this is temperature in Celsius. So let's say 19, 18.9. We could all dream of that temperature being outside, right? Okay, so this is our, our measurement, and this creates a tuple, right? We could print out the type of M, and we could also print out M, right? Tuple, like that, that's good. Uh, what's interesting about tuples is it's not the parentheses that matter, it's actually the comma. So if you wanted like a tuple of one thing, you would say like this, and you'd get the same, the same uh, behavior. Right? There's a, a tuple of one thing, so that's kind of funky. That's pretty straightforward, and I don't think there's a whole lot that, that's news there. If you're using tuples a lot, you should really think of named tuples. Um, I think I might have an example that 
just along the side uses it. What's cool about these is you can unpack them in all sorts of interesting ways we already saw. So like if we want just the X to Y and then you say like, I don't really care about this other stuff. In Python, the way this, that you say, I don't care about a value is underscore. I'll show you an example in just a sec. But we can say that here is the value and then I could print out as comma Y, right? You could even repeat these little, I don't care variable declarations. All right, so we run that, that's pretty cool. It should say 0.4 and 0.9 and got them out. And there's all kinds of interesting little algorithm shortenings and simplifications, like swapping a variable um, is just one line in Python because of this. All right, you start out with two variables. They're just standalone variables. This bit right here, that comma, makes those a tuple, and then you unpack them in a different order. And now you should get 0 0.9, 0 0.4 as the answer. Um, did I do that right? No, because yeah. I wrote it the same. I got If I really want to swap them, I should probably put them in a different order. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, 0 0.9, 0 0.4. So this is, this is pretty cool, and you saw that stuff already here in our bad version. That itself is tuple unpacking, right? So we can do like nice clean stuff with this. Like these numbers look familiar. We'll, we'll see them come back. These Fibonacci numbers, right? Incredible how often those show up. So if we wanted to print them out, that's super easy. F in N, print F. Maybe we want them on all in one line. So we'll say in line as a comma instead of a, a new line. We run that. Then we get all of our Fibonacci numbers in one line. But if we want to name, like number them, like number one, number two, number three, well, that's not as cool then. So we come over here, we can say enumerate this. And what that returns, if we just print the type of F, it returns a tuple, a bunch of tuples, the index and then the value, right? So, so here we could say um, something like IDX value, or I called it F. All right, so we could do something like this, print... Um, the number dot the value dot format. Oh, let's do the right. Let's do this right here. A little f idx plus one and f. Yeah. So we run this, and then we get the first, the second, the third Fibonacci, and so on. All right. So this tuple unpacking you'll see appear all over the place. Um, super super nice. And like I said, it makes algorithms simpler. So if we wanted to create Fibonacci numbers come over here and we'll give it a limit for now. Later we'll go and write one that has like an infinite series, but for now we'll give it a limit. So we'll say, create a place to store them. Um, we'll say while length of nums is less than the limit, we'll do something, and then we'll return the numbers. All right, so I don't know how much you guys studied algorithms and had to pay attention to this kind of these al these sort of little algorithms and stuff in like say computer science 101. But the, the way that you create a Fibonacci series is you create two variables, a uh, current, let's say that's equal to zero, and a next, uh, and I'll say, whoops, since next is a keyword or function, I'll, I'll make that uh, NXT. So you create these two and then you have to do something like this. You say temp equals current, uh, current equals next, uh, nxt, nxt equals current plus temp, something like that. And then you would do, uh, do count zero, let's do this. Let's do nums.append current. Let's see if I got that right. Um, I didn't call it, so nobody knows. All right, let's find out. So fib of 10. So we get the first 10 numbers, and let's print those out. All right, so yeah, it looks like I got that algorithm right. And this is the crummy uh, C way, right? So in Python, we could do this bit better. We could say current next equals 0, 1, right? Tuples. Down here, this whole swap temporary variable thing, this is ick. We could just say current, current next is next and current plus next. So I kind of, I know this tuple stuff is sort of beginner, uh, sort of, you know, standard Python stuff, but it's, you know, once you really embrace it for these algorithms, it gets really, really nice. So here you see we get exactly the same result, but this, the way in which we express it is so much more tight. And if you come from Java, you come from C++, you come from C Sharp, like you would never think to write code like this, right?
and we'll see we can actually simplify this and drop a limit if we do a little bit more Pythonic goodness. Right? Questions, comments? All right, cool. So I'll go ahead. Yeah. Do you need the parentheses? Uh, no, you don't. I could drop this here if I wanted. For example, there are times when you need it. Uh, for example, if you're doing um, a set comprehension, like so, if I'm doing this sum and I want to put a uh, like a generator expression or within a generator expression, I want to create a tuple as the projection of it. There's like a few places. That's one of the places where you actually need this. Um, but in general, you don't. We'll get to those later and I can try to throw an example in, in there for you. Okay, so let's carry on to the next one, getting slightly more advanced and interesting. So this one is about writing bad code and it's sort of a, a life lesson um, for those that like to break rules, I guess. And you know, Python is kind of a rule breaker language, as you'll see. So here we have something, and to be honest, it doesn't matter what the implementation is, that's why I wrote pass, but like, imagine we have this download service, and it can download a file, but in order for it to download a file, you have to make sure that some stuff is okay, that the network is on, that you have access to that part of the network or to even do an outbound connection, um, that the download, download URL is specified correctly and it matches, you know, like a HTTP type of URL, not FTP, for example. Right, so there's all these things that you might need to check. And so there's two fundamental theories about error handling and writing safe code in programming languages in general. One is this concept of look before you leap, okay? So this is, this is C style, uh, C++ doesn't have to be this way, but it generally is. Um, Java, C Sharp, you, it's kind of up for debate, for debate who, who's writing the code. So let's go through these little steps here. It says, all right, for this look before you leap thing, what we're gonna do is say uh, service equals, we create with these download services. And then we need to check some stuff. We'll say if a server dot um, check allow access, I'll say if not that, right? We'll say print, oh, no access. And then we'll, we'll bail out early, right? Um, let me put this in a method just so you can see. Um, so this like return early business works. Okay, so We've got this, we're gonna do this check, and then we're gonna do another check. Uh, let's say uh, check URL, um, no URL, do another check. What is my third thing? Check network, I think it was. Yes, no network, network. All right, if everything is passed and all is good, then we're allowed to say server.download file, right? Like this, and then we could say save file, file. All right, something to this effect. So this is all, all well and good. And this would be like how you might write code in C. And the reason is if you get this wrong in C, it's like a, a seg fault, a page fault. Uh, a, a, basically, you know, your program just goes poof and goes away or the user gets a bad dialogue or something, right? There's not proper error handling. So this is typically not how it's done in Python. Instead, we use this way that I prefer that the way is for the rule breakers is it's easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission. <laughs> all right. So, so we take all this code and we just say, you know what, we're going to try to do something. This is our, let's just do it. And we'll say, let's go uh, mimic this, we'll create the download service. And then we'll say server download files. And then we'll say, save file file, which I'm going to, Save again up here. And then if something goes wrong, then we say, oh, accept, print. Sorry, that wasn't good, right? Something failed here. And typically you have an exception as X and you've got some sort of details and you can, you can give the error details like so. And let's just stick with my fancy little F string there. Okay, so we're gonna print that out. Now, what we also can do is, as you probably know, is we can use multiple exceptions. So we could say, uh, what if there's a socket exception? Is that even a thing? Error? I'm not sure. Yeah, whatever, there's gonna be one, right? Imagine this existed somewhere in the framework and the standard library. Um, we could catch it, right? So 
we can sort of try the simplest possible thing, just do it in the order that it expects, and then you know, use the error handling. Yeah, this we need to change, like SE, let's see down here. We could say something, like, you know, more specific errors like no network, check the Wi-Fi, or whatever. Okay, so when you're writing Python code, the Pythonic thing to do is to really embrace that it's easier to ask for forgiveness. That doesn't mean never check, right? Like sometimes this disambiguity on errors doesn't make sense, or it's going to have some, like, modifying effect of trying it before uh, like it's going to create a file and, and then do another thing that might fail. You don't want that intermediate thing left around. But in general, um, it's all about the this, right? So, you know, maybe there's some other case that we're not thinking about here and we're going to end up in exceptions anyway, right? Like, did we check whether the DNS of the URL was actually valid? No, we didn't. <laughs> So and we need one more test, right? It's super hard to be really exhaustive about all the things you need to check. Um, that's why there's so many vulnerabilities and whatnot in C code and crashes and, and so on, right? But in the Python world, you just write it straight up like this, yeah? So it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. That's the way. Comments, questions? All right, cool. So uh, feel free to interrupt me as well. I don't mind if you guys interrupt me at all. So next one, let's look at lambdas. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So let's let's write a, a few little functions that uh, use lambda expressions, and then we'll we'll move those on to generators. Now we could have a, a cool um, find even numbers function. Uh, if you give it a set of numbers, it'll tell you the even ones, and so it'll say, oops. Give us the numbers. Now, watch this. If I come over and say nums dot, what do I get? Nothing. Nothing at all, right? I get basically, well, if seems like a keyword, maybe we'll show you that. And you can see it's grayed out because like, I don't really think this is what you're looking for. So just straight away, one of the things you can do here is I can say that this is a list. You guys seen this? This is uh, Python 3, 4, 3, 5. I can't remember which. There's definitely some changes along the way. But recent Python 3, I think it's 3.5. But now if I have that, I come in here and say dot, and boom, there are all of the items. All right, so these type hints or type annotations are pretty interesting. And I would say use them judiciously, but they're, they're pretty cool. Now, the other thing is if I say, uh, give me an item out of here, dot, it's all of a sudden, yeah, I don't know what the first item is because I have no idea what's in this list, right? It could be anything. These can be even heterogeneous. So we could like up this a level here. We could say capital list, and that doesn't sound like it's any better. It looks worse. But if you import it, there's a typing dot list. And I could say there's a list of int. And then when I come down and say nums, like it's still like this. But if I say dot, those are integer operations. Um, and we could even go so far to say, you know, this method returns a, like a, a process list of integers. Okay. See, PyCharm is saying, you say it returns a list of integers, it doesn't. Now, I would say, like I, like I did say, use this judiciously. But where I find this super helpful is like as I'm crossing major architectural layers of my application. So there might be a data access layer with like 50 functions that's like a thousand lines of code. Maybe those 50 functions would do really well to have these annotations, but not the rest of your code, right? So you know as you transition in and out of the database exactly what you're getting. Anyway, you can take it or leave it, but uh, I'll put it in here just for the heck of it. So we can say this, for n in nums, we want to say, well, if it's even, uh, super subtract, no, mod zero, we want to somehow gather this up, right? So I have to have other numbers equals this or found numbers or special numbers or even numbers take your pick but we'll put it in there at the end we'll return other numbers and pycharm will breathe a sigh of relief and that little highlight up here goes away yeah so that's pretty cool i could come down here and i could say print find even numbers of that data and we should get what two we do there's two right there but this is super constrained, right? It only finds even numbers. This is like uh, this algorithm here, which granted is pretty much a toy example, but this algorithm, it could find any kind of numbers. It could find prime numbers. It could find odd numbers, numbers that are both divisible by three and two, 
take your pick. And so we could use um, functions, which are for first class uh, items in Python, or even Lambda expressions, which is where we're going, to add in here like a test. Now, I don't remember the way to say, here's the signature of this function in type hints, so I'm just gonna leave it like this for now. But this is gonna be a test function that instead of running this code, we'll say test of n, and if whatever test you provide to us, like basically you'll pass in a way to say, is this uh, an interesting number? If it is, then we'll gather it up and print it out for you. So for example, I could define even, or let's say this is even, as n, and we'll just return n mod to zero. And we could pass that in down here as even, like a, as a function, not as an invocation, right? So this should behave exactly the same, except for now, it's way, way more extensible, right? You would say this little bit of code sort of follows the open-close principle in the sense that it could be extended without changing it. So maybe we want to go and say, well, let's write a function called is odd because that's fun. Or how about, yeah, we'll say it is odd for now. And now we can get all the odd numbers. There should be more of those. There they are. All right, but this writing this little function, this is kind of a drag. So we don't want to do that. So what we can do, obviously, in Python, even in Python 2, we could say lambda. Here's a little tiny fragment of code. Here's his argument. And given that argument, what is the return value? All right, is this is the return value, true or false, even, not even. So this is cool, let's go back to even, right? Because this are even. If we had a one here, it would go back to its odds, also good. But if we had a six, it could answer whether or not it's divisible by two and three. And apparently we're gonna need one more number for that, um, 24. 24 special, okay. So these lambdas are super, super valuable and we could also use them to sort. Like suppose we wanna sort this data. So apparently it has a sort method, so we're probably done sorting it, that's cool. Oh, except what if I wanna sort it by magnitude of number? I want like minus one and one to be first and then five and then nine and then 20 and then 24 and then negative 100. Like how far are you from zero? Or what's your magnitude? How do we do that? Right. You could debate whether we should call sort or pass sorted. It depends on whether you want to modify data or create a new list, which is the sorted variant. But it doesn't really matter. They have the same behavior, right? So what we could do here is we could say the key, and the key actually is a function. I didn't pick the name key, but we all live with it, right? It's actually a function whose job is given an element of this list, give me the thing to actually sort by. So we can come down here and say lambda, given um, a number here, I wanna return the absolute value of the number. So I wanna sort by magnitude. So now if we run this, you can see we get down here at the bottom, exactly that version we were looking for, right? Smallest magnitude. If you want big magnitude first, just throw a negative in there. All right, now we have negative 100 first, then 24, then 20, and so on. So this idea of these lambda expressions are super, super important um, in, in Python. All right, questions, comments? Uh, I, I'm kind of curious why you think that the type annotations should be used sparingly or judiciously. So, okay, so that's a good example. Um, a good question. I think it really depends on you and your team. The reason I think that is because the tooling, and it could be that I use PyCharm versus other people who use something like Vim plus a linter, right? But what I found is if I use it at just sort of like the kicking off point for my applications, then when I go down here, so if I go and call this, um, it's still called find even numbers, let's call this uh, find special. <laughs> Whoops. Go away, find numbers, there we go. Because it's not e just even. So I go down here and I call this find numbers thing again. I say result equals that, result dot. You can see I get append, extend, clear already, all right? So, so PyCharm already knows that this is a list of integers. And if I return this farther up the stack, 
it will actually traverse the, the abstract syntax tree and it'll already know, it'll like have been sufficiently seeded to know the result of higher is also a list and it'll give me other stuff. So if I come down here, um, I can't think of a great example. Maybe, maybe if I pull up, let's see, pull up my uh, podcast website. Did I do that? Actually, don't even remember if this one has it, but let's find out. So if I go down here to this, to the Mongo repository, yeah. Okay, so like see this get episode bit right here. It returns an episode. So if I go and find like where that's used, it's used in a couple of places throughout my stuff here. I can come down here and I say target dot and it already knows, right? And so as I pass these things around, like once it gets kind of started knowing about these type annotations, it, it carries them through. And so it lets you take advantage of the, the simplicity of not saying types everywhere and make, keeping the code really readable, but you get the same level of benefit by putting it just at the lowest layer. That's, oh, that's why I said that. So, um, I prefer to read it without types, but I also prefer to have my editor help me a whole bunch if it can. Like, oh yeah, that was show good, not good, or whatever it was I needed right there, right? I see. Yeah, but I don't need to put the types at a higher level necessarily to make that work, um, I, I guess is what I'm saying. Okay, yeah. thank you. Sure. Okay, but I, I don't want to scare you off from them. If you think they're helpful to you, put them in there. Um, they have zero runtime behavior at all, right? It's just a dev tooling assist, right? Also maybe for the lenders. Okay, cool, so let's go on to generators. Now, let's just carry on where we left off from this. So we had this function we wrote, actually it was over in tuples. We had this function that we wrote here, like so. And it's a Fibonacci, it's cool, we can call it, uh, let's call, a uh, Fibs equals fib of 10. Hold on. My Alexa is trying to talk to us. It's asking me about Fibonacci. <laughs> Hold on. Alexa, stop. There, now it's a mute. It won't talk to me. Okay, so <laughs> we come over here and we, we have these, but what if I wanted to do this? I want to loop through this and I say if some condition, like it's prime and the previous one next to it was also prime, then maybe I'm trying to explore something special about the Fibonacci's. I'm just going to say um, it's greater than 20, then I'll break. But there could be some really interesting case between relationships of these numbers, and I don't know what it is, right? Um, print a uh, processing uh, n. Right, so let's run this. Run, run, run. All right, so let's process those numbers. However, what if this number is large? What if it's a thousand? What if I don't know what the limit is? Like, when do I stop putting numbers in here to like check my condition for two consecutive primes greater than a million or, you know, whatever, right? How do I know how many to generate? Maybe I need to get it back and then I need to know. So even if I do this, um, right, that's, that's maybe a bad idea. So right now it's thinking, right? And it's creating a million Fibonacci numbers. It's going, is that a million? It's not very responsive anymore. Yeah, so that's a million. And it's going to use a lot of memory. It's using tons of computational power and, and so on. And I really only wanted the first five, right? So we can just ever so slightly change this code so we could kind of ignore this limit, right? And this is super awesome. Let me do, let me inline this real quick because this having it out like that doesn't help with anything. Okay, so here it is. Now, let's just go over here and take away this limit and just write something insane at first, right? While true, that seems like a fix, right? It's gonna fix it. So when is that function gonna end? As soon as it crashes, you're running out of memory, or you give up on it and crash, you cancel it, right? It's going, to, and I'm sure run out of memory is probably the first, I don't know, it's going to be bad either way. So this is not great, right? So we're, the problem really, the fundamental problem is we're computing all the answers, and then we're giving you that setback. So Python has this concept of generators, which is beautiful, and it will let you 
uh, basically create this thing called a coroutine that will say, here is one of the items in this collection, process it, and then if you want more, ask for another. And you can ask for another in all sorts of ways, but the easiest is to use it in iteration. All right. So the way you say, here's one of my items in my thing, instead of doing this append, you just say yield current. You, yield means here is one of the things in my collection. All right, now this doesn't necessarily look like it's any better. We're still doing this while true. This seems bad, but if I run it, I think it'll do better. In fact, it's super, super quick. And it just created, created an infinite sequence, right? How awesome is that? So let's set a breakpoint and figure out what is going on. So I hit the little bug. So here we are. Um, there's some really cool stuff in PyCharm that'll let you like kind of watch this. So we're coming over here, we're gonna call this, and it's gonna do what you would expect with any function. We'll step in over here. It goes down, you can see current is zero, next is one, see PyCharm like sort of puts this little, I don't know, teal looking like current value thing there. So we go in and it says great, now current is one, next is one, you can see it changed the color of the thing for current. And then it's gonna do this yield thing which actually returns back down here, and you see now n is one, down at the bottom, line nine. Okay, that's kind of funky, but all right, we'll go ahead and print that out, processing n. Now here's where it gets super different than a, a regular function, is we're going to go back into Fibonacci, but we're not gonna go to line three, we're going to back to line four with the value of current being one and next being one. So these are like resumable functions, yeah? So here we are, current's one, I'll just click around a few times. So it seems more obvious. Now, like you can see, we're jumping right back in. Current's three, next is five. So that's really wild. And it has super important consequences. Anytime you're doing like large data sets or processing lots of things, like I want to read a million records out of a CSV and then do something with them. Well, if instead of tossing them into a list, you just use this yield keyword, you can create this way of working with it really, really nicely. And you will only ever have sort of one instance of it in memory ever. And if you decide to stop after creating 20, even though it's an infinite sequence, it just contently stops. What do you guys think? Cool? And you can chain these things too. So let's comment that out. So we could have um, def odds. We kind of wrote this, but I'll just do this. For n in nums, if n mod two is one, we can yield n, right? So we could do, um, let's do this. So we could come over here and say, I wanna get nums is fib, uh, like that. And then we could have odd nums is actually odd of the Fibonacci generator. So I can take this generator, which only gets one thing at a time, um, pluralize that, pass it over here, and then when this loop pulls on it, it's only going to uh, return one at a time, but it's gonna sort of pull on the nums as many times as it needs till it finds one of them that's odd to give back to you. Uh, so then we could, this is probably enough, we could say four O in odd numbers. Uh, I guess I need to, yeah, odd numbers. Print O. Uh, we better put a break. We'll say if O is greater than 100, break. All right, so we run this. We have this perfectly chained together. Here's the, only the odd Fibonacci numbers. And the, both of those are infinite sequences, and both of them ran like in a few milliseconds. That's cool, right? So you can create these data pipelines that one flows into the next, flows into the next, but they're like as efficient as possible. Right, if you might wonder like, well, what is the type of odd numbers? We could just print out the type of odd. It's not a list, it's a whoop, generator. Which means there's interesting things. So like, uh, what if I did this? Um, watch this, print length of odd numbers. Or let's, uh, let's get the sum of them, rather, or average or whatever. All right, we'll print out the sum of them, and then we're gonna print out um, you know, the first whatever till 100, except for that, maybe not so much. Um, hold on. <laughs> Let me change the order. It was it was summing up an infinite sequence. All right. Um, 
Yeah, I guess because it's infinite, it's it's not really going to stop. But the idea, the, the one thing that you run into is like once one of these is used up, um, this like we'll just do a four O N odd nums. I'll print more is O like so, and then if O is greater than two hundred, break. Here we go. Um, So you come down here and see it went through all those and then it said next loop, oh, boom, there's only one item in that loop. And that's because once these get used up, they're kind of done. And so, you know, you'd have to like grab them to a list or something if you wanna keep, keep hold of them, use them more than once. All right, so we don't have a lot of time left, but I have two uh, cool sort of follow on things for you here. And I think we got plenty of time to cover them nonetheless. So let's go over and look at this one. It apparently is unhappy from the get-go. Here's our named tuple, right? I showed you tuples before. If you're gonna use them and you want to like interact with them in any reasonable way and you would like things like X, Y, ID, like actual values and not just indices, you can create this name tuple and tell it what the values mean and then put in the values. Whoops, the values are right there. But let's take this scenario where we have some measurements, okay? These are Kind of like I said before, like they've got some kind of GUID, they've got like a location on a grid and a value. Yeah, that's how that works out. Okay, so what we wanna do is we wanna go through and find the ones that have a high value. And to me, in this little example, high means 70 or higher for that last number over there, okay? So I come from C, and C I say this, I say um, count equals length, of um, what was it called measurements? Yeah, measurements while count um, index equals zero while index is less than count. We'll say m equals uh, measurements of index if m dot value is greater than or equal to 70, then we want to stash it in this little high measurements thing. A uh, one, yeah, dot append M. And then down here we'll say index plus, plus equals one. Now you should never ever write this, right? Um, let's, is this the one I was unhappy about? I think so. Hi, mem gen, yes. We'll get back to that. Great, so here these are, you know, this, this is an extreme case. Like you would probably, you would probably learn pretty quick. You don't do this in Python. In Python, we were good, good developers. We've learned that it goes like this. So it's a four um, M in measurements, right? Like somebody's told you like, hey, dude, this isn't C, don't write that. So now you can get it to run and basically work the same again, right? You just four in loop. What we're doing is still, you're creating this loop. And loops are fine. This imperative code here is fine, except for if you need to pass it as part of a larger expression. So what you see, especially in the data science world, is they create these kind of chains of stuff. And if I could put this little test as part of like a larger statement, this might be a lot nicer and a lot cleaner. So in Python, we have this way to use list comprehensions. And Instead of creating this list up here and then doing a test and adding to it, we can do it like this. And I always try to write it kind of the second level down first. So you would say this, you'd say the same thing as loop 4M in measurements. So this I call the, um, the from clause. So think of this as kind of like in, in memory uh, data queries. And then up here you have the thing you're going to select. Let's suppose we only want the value. So up here we should put like dot value. Okay. So we'll add the value. Uh, this is like the select project bit. And then down here, we'll have the test. We'll say if m dot uh, value is greater than or equal to seven. All right, so this is pretty cool and it should look the same. It does, you can see down there, right there. So this is, I would say, a little more Pythonic, right? This definitely takes advantage of that, but sometimes this also makes sense. So what this does is this executes exactly the same way as in our tuple thing. It executes exactly the same way as this, like build up, run, gather up all the data, and then give me the finished list in memory. 
what would be cool is if there's a way to do it like this, where we have our this version of Fibonacci that like doesn't actually pull all the items in the computer. It just gives it back to you as you ask for it. So there's this super simple way of saying that here. Let's say this, put it like this first. So here's exactly the same list comprehension. And the way to say, don't generate me a list and wait to give me all the answers, but create one of these yield like generators is so subtle that it can be tricky as you change the square brace to a parenthesis. Now, if you print this out, you'll see generator there. But uh, where'd it go? Hi, Mem Gen. Yeah. If we actually want to put it out so we can print it and see it, we got to like throw it to the list and then print that out here. Okay. So this should give us exactly the same answer as you see right here. But it did it in that really cool coroutine style that didn't actually load everything at once. Like if this measurements was a billion records, it would still only load one float into memory at a time. I mean, maybe a couple for working variables, but really it would only load one item in memory at a time, which is incredible. Okay, so square brace, parenthesis, very, very different, right? And the last thing is what if we want to dictionary these things? So the same idea that we have here, <coughs> we could put into curly braces, right? These curly braces, as we saw right at the beginning, dictionary. So this, what we could do is we could actually come over here and if the thing that goes here in the select part is actually the key colon value. So the, the key would be m.id and let's just say the value is m. All right, if that's the case, then when we print this out, we get this dictionary id lookup finds the measurement. id lookup finds the measurement. All right, it's pretty awesome. Now if you want just the distinct values like do i have any values duplicated let's go look if i'm not uh okay 90 is duplicated right so here you can see in this list all the list versions 90 is duplicated if you want to just know what are the measurements that are high not exactly what are all the values right there's three 90s we could take this almost the same thing and by the way if i print the type of high by id we'll see it's a dictionary right so we have the same statement, curly, curly, and in here, instead of having a key comma value, you just have the value, that value. This becomes, oops, a set. And the set is distinct items. So 72, 73, 90, those are the high value measurements regardless of how many times they occur. And it's also super fast for like uh, inclusion lookups, just like dictionaries, unlike a list, for example. Okay, so we can take all these ideas and, and mix them up. Uh, we can basically take these loops here and wrap them up into these here. And you can actually have multiple, uh, multiple lines. You can have like from um, VN, like let's say M dot values, if the measurement had a list of values and that would like, you know, up here you just put like V or something. That would actually create like a flat list out of a hierarchy, right? but I don't have that set up for. So, boom, there you go. All right, questions, comments? It's really cool. Yeah, it's fun, right? So Those you can, uh, yeah. And, and <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what was that? I could barely hear you. I had that in a text mining class. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And these, like down here, these are chainable in the same way that the Fibonacci and the odd numbers are chainable. Uh, I mean, there's the same generators, it's just different syntax to get to them. All right, so the last one I want to talk about has to do with any time you have huge amounts of data. So this, this last example comes, is it up here? No, there's no link. No link to where it comes from. But there's this company called Oyster, Oyster something or other. And they're a, like a hotel review site. Um, I think Yelp for hotels or something like that. And they had a website that had tons and tons of in-memory Python objects cached. So that would be faster. But this doesn't just only apply to web. If you're doing data science and you're going to load up a whole bunch of data there comes a point where you're gonna load more data than you have memory for, right? And then that's where you say, well, I can no longer analyze this data. I have to like ship it to Amazon or do something else because uh, it's too much to fit in the memory of my, my computer, right? 
or even if it does fit, but it causes swapping, then it kills the performance, right? So we're going to look at four, I think there's four different ways of holding this data. Um, yeah, there's not much going on there. So the idea is we're going to have a regular class. So here we have this class um, called mutable thing. It has some values. I made the names longer than ABC uh, because that seems more realistic. And actually the memory usage is oddly at first once until you understand the internals or think about the internals. This is oddly the memory usage of this class depends on the length of the name of the fields. Okay, so AXXXXX takes way more memory to create an instance of it than just self.a equals a. So anyway, uh, this seemed more realistic because most people don't name all their fields ABC, yeah, but it doesn't really matter. Now, we're gonna use this line right here. Literally, this one line is like the focus of this whole, uh, whole presentation. How, raise your hands, how many of you guys know what that line means? All right, awesome. So what this, go ahead. Oh, we had one hand. One hand, okay, yeah. So that's how I felt about it as well. Like, wait, what, slots, dunder slots, what is this? So when I create one of these, let's just really quick, m1 equals mutable thing. So this is like a standard Python class, m2. But I can print out m1.dunderdict. Let's put different values in here m2.dunderdict, okay. I'm gonna run this, it'll do some other stuff, but you can see there's these dictionaries that actually are the backing store, <clears throat> excuse me, these dictionaries are the backing store for the fields, right? Where I say self.axxxx, that is a key in a dictionary. And it turns out, if I look at the ID of that dictionary, the ID of members like the memory address, more or less, like a proxy for it, these are not the same. So every time I, instantiate one of these, I effectively instantiate a new dictionary with a copy of the keys that go to it. You may think that that's inefficient. That's inefficient. <laughs> it totally is. So um, what this slots thing does, if I go down here and make an immutable thing, and I try to print out i.dunderdict, you'll see it doesn't like it so much. It has no dunderdict. So what it does is it moves the definition of what the field names are, and maybe I guess they should be like xxx on the end. It doesn't, because there, you'll see there's only one copy, it doesn't really matter. This gets moved to the type, not to the instance. You can see the behavior down here is identical. But if I try to add another one, self.e equals one, two, three, um, can't do that. You'll see, uh, let me uh, instantiate one though. You'll see it's like, uh, it has no attribute E. Normally this is how you define the attributes or the fields and you can't do it. And that's because what you're saying is I'm freezing things, the types of things this can hold. It can only hold A, B, C, or D. And that's gonna be held per type, not per instance of the type. So if I have a million of these, I have one of these. But if I have a million of these, I have a million copies of AXXX, BXXX, CXX, and you can imagine that kills the memory. All right, so let's run a few little test cases down here. So I've got a million items. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through and like basically create a million items, ask how much memory is used, ask how long it took. And we're gonna say, let's start as simple as possible. Like you might think if we use tuples, that's like the minimum amount of memory and CPU and whatnot that we can use. So let's run this tuple version here. See, it, it ran in 0.5 milliseconds. Um, oh, it doesn't show the memory, does it? That's unfortunate. I have another version of this code that actually shows the memory, but that's all right, it prints it out. So we can do this. Uh, there's a lot of these running, by the way. See these all along here? So let's stop all these. There's a way in PyCharm to say don't do that. If you go up to this, what's called a run configuration, you can say only run one and kill off the other uh, when that happens. So let's run over here and we should have one instance of Python. And you can see, and if you go to the memory, it's 209-ish. Right? This is not a perfect measure of how much memory is used and so on, but 209 for tuples. So let me write that down here. Uh, come here, Visual Studio Code, go over here. Uh, tuples. Uh, 
209. And you'll see the speed is like half a second. So this is actually the fastest, but it's in terms of memory, it's not the best. Okay, so let's go and say, all right, well, name tuples. I'd much rather work with name tuples than tuples. What does that mean for memory? Let's try it. Um, okay, so now it ran. It took three times as long because it's doing tons and tons of work, but memory-wise, 216. 216. All right. Great, so a little more memory, uh, three times as slow, not the best outcome, but you know, there's a huge programmer benefit and this is like really kind of a pathological performance case. So let's try to create a regular Python class. This is like any class anyone knows about. Runs, it runs, it runs. All right, it took two seconds, so four times as long as a tuple, not great. Memory wise, 300 megs almost, 294 class. Like that is a big difference, right? That's 50% more memory so that I have behavior plus data, not just data, right? But classes are really great for modeling, so maybe it's worth it. Check this out. Suppose we said, okay, well, we're not going to dynamically at runtime add stuff. We're happy with just the type definition holding the things. If you're willing to do that, then we come down here and change this to the slot version, and we run it, and we get... Uh, what is that, 25% faster, even faster than name tuples, right? So you get these full-on classes with constructors, initialization, uh, Python data model like Dunder, Iter, whatever, all of that stuff, and still faster than even name tuples. Okay, and let's look at memory. 200. Um, slot version. Even less memory than tuples themselves. So you get the behavior and all the richness of a class, um, speed of name tuples, and memory better than anything else you can do. So I would not say just go around and throw slots on everything you do, but if you have something like, we're gonna process a million of these, and it's like really a memory problem to have all this stuff loaded up, like one, literally one line of code, which is line uh, 33, unlocks a ton of magic. Questions, comments? So you might think that this is not Pythonic because it's kind of fighting against the structure and like the way regular classes work. And I would, to I would tend to agree with you a little bit on that. But if you go over here and you run um, PT Python, which is like a, a sweet autocomplete version of a Python REPL, you could say import this, right? Um, so there's special cases aren't special enough to break the rules. Although practicality beats purity. The guys at the o Oyster, I think is the name of that, that uh, site, they were able to take nine servers offline and consolidate them down by just adding that one line to like a few types in their model. So I think that's a heavy dose of practicality right there. All right, well, that's, those are all the topics I think we got time to cover. We spent about an hour and five minutes, so I guess I timed it pretty well. I'll just open up to general questions, and I have a few follow-on things for you before I hand it back to George. Okay, questions. Oh, and by the way, there will be all this code right here. It's not here yet, but if I go over here and I, I say command K, yes. So add from presentation while you guys are thinking. Presentation, there you go. Command and push. Wait for it. There you go. So now at this address, this thing keeps getting in my way, I can't see it. You probably can't see there's a little drop down for this uh, uh, presentation, but I'll give you guys that link uh, to share in a little bit. But all the code we just wrote together is now there for you to go and play with as you want. Just fork it, download it, whatever. Okay, questions? Yes, uh, so front row. So um, you showed an example of looping through and I guess in the highest value. How would yeah. you do one 
did like the rank, like a rank value, like basically like the um, just the highest value of that array. What's that one up? Um, so if I wanted the one that was just that, so yeah, what would I do? I guess I would do something like this and I would combine these, these, so this is a great question. Actually, I didn't realize how good of a question it was at first. So well done. This one, um, shows how you can combine, um, some of these things. So I could, you would, what I would do is I would say, um, M equals max of, uh, or say, uh, Val. Say call it high val just by itself. And we print highest value is high val, like so. Like that. You would want to just throw in here high measurements. Uh, high measurements. Or just measurements, right? Excuse me. Now you could, if you put in like high measurements where I throw the value in there. This may work, but if I throw in like a, a, a list of these named tuples, it's not going to love it. Hold on. Let me run the correct one here. Um, you can see, I, I don't really know how it came up with this. Maybe it gave me the highest ID because that's first, but value 73 is definitely not the highest. We saw there's a 90 in there. Let me change one of those 90s to 91, right? Just so there, I'll put it like in the middle. So there's a clear winner for highest. And you see that that is not 91. So something's going wrong here. So what we can do is we can come over here and I can say right in line with max, I can do one of these things. I can say max of m dot value for m in measurements. And just in this like one little line, convert a list of measurements into a list of values and then ask for the max of that. If you run that, you should get 91 at the end. And that's good, but there's no reason that Max actually needs all of these in memory at once before it starts going through. It's just going through and going, uh, I got a temp variable of the current maximum, which is like negative infinity or something. And if any value comes through that's bigger than that, we'll set this to the newer one, right? So we can handle them as a stream. So if we put parentheses around this, it converts the list comprehension to a generator expression. And now this is like the ultra efficient one in memory at a time conversion to a max which then gives us that so you should get the same answer but just knowing inside like it's slightly more glorious does that help yes it gets a little more complicated to like use this one little expression to say give me the measurement that is the highest um you would probably go and create a class that um that you can somehow do that test against right um I'll override some method. I actually don't know off the top of my head what method that would be, but there probably is one. Other questions? Um, yeah, next, you had one next door. Uh, yeah, um, I was curious about the lambdas. You were using those. Uh, I rarely ever put those into my code. Um, when do you, would you use those instead of this? Uh, well, I think you should think of a list comprehension a little bit like a lambda like this is kind of a lambda like given you know this is this little part right there is kind of like lambda m goes to m dot value right and this test is a little bit like m goes to m dot value greater than or equal to 70 so you can kind of think of these uh, list comprehensions a little bit like or, or generate expressions or dictionary comprehensions so all as a, a family of things think of them as kind of being built out of lambdas in a sense. I'm not sure that's actually the underlying implementation, but they're, they're kind of like that. What I would use them for is like cases like this, like where I'm, I'm sorting out this value and I need to pass a function and the, the operation of that function is ultra simple, right? It doesn't make it, if I wrote um, um, something like this, like def get key, uh, what was that, n? With that, like that. And I come down here and I say, get key I like this I implement that like so and let's close it up so you don't know like you read this line right here this is entirely opaque right it's utterly meaningless until you track down what get key actually means and it's probably something devious that's changed over time because like it probably made sense at one point and then maybe maybe it says get max value and actually what it's returning in the implementation if you look up here is minimum value 
I mean, I got to remove the Lambda bit, but you know what I mean? Like it's implementation has moved away when it was so simple. It should have just been put in line here. And so when you find yourself in that situation, then you should totally think of like, okay, Lambda. So there should be a return a negative ABS of N, but like, don't do, don't do that. Do that instead, because that line of code is all you need to know to understand what's happening here. Whereas if you do it, this other function, you do it in lots of places. And I don't really know how to solve this problem with a list comprehension. Like the one thing I really actually wish was in list comprehensions um, here was order by m dot value or, or whatever, right? Like if that was there, um, that would be great, but it's not. Does that make sense? So um, my rule of thumb is if it's a super simple little transformation type thing and moving it away actually makes it harder to understand the code. Um, but the more complicated it gets, the less sense that that makes to try to jam it to a Lambda. You're getting a nod. Yeah, that's, that's a good explanation. It. Yeah, I use Thank it you. for um, like sorting. You have like a list of tuples or something. And you're trying to sort, I like a certain value, right? In that, in those tuples, then Lambda is really good. But, yeah, exactly, exactly. Because you could come, if this was a measurement, like if we were over in our measurement thing, uh, here, yes. If we wanted to sort this, um, let's just say measurements.sort, and then I'll print. Oops, that's not running, is it? Like you can see, there's no, there's no sense to the sorting, right? So what you would do is you would say, here, key uh, equals lambda m goes to m dot value, or if you want to reverse sorted like this. So you would take this list of tuples and basically pull out the piece that you're looking for. And then you get your 91, your 90, down at the end, we should have the smallest of 11 and then 40. Yeah, I agree. I, I, that's when I find I, I use them the most as well. Yes, sir. This is a more general question. Say so you're doing more JavaScript. How do you like JavaScript compared to Python? Oh gosh. I'm only writing JavaScript because I have to. Um, I, I'm working on, I'm working on some apps like iOS apps, Android apps, and stuff. And what I'm using is Ionic. And Ionic is really, really sweet for building native apps that look like iOS, look like Android. And I'm also using, I also work on some Windows and Mac apps using Electron JS which I think I can use basically the same code for more or less and then create Mac, Windows, and Linux apps. And the ability to make apps for those five different platforms, like that is really, really appealing. I'm willing to write JavaScript to do it. If there was a Python way to do it, I would absolutely write it in Python. Um, I know there's like PyQt and stuff, but you know, that doesn't help me for mobile. I'd still got to rewrite it in something anyway, so I decided to just write JavaScript. But given the choice, I, I think Python is a vastly better language than JavaScript. I don't know why JavaScript got so complicated. Because it's on every browser on Earth. <laughs> yeah, this, that's, that, that is the feature that wins no matter what compared to language features or whatever. Right? That is more important than anything else, and that's why we end up writing JavaScript. By the way, I just interviewed a guy from my podcast on this thing called Anvil. And Anvil lets you write client-side JavaScript in Python. Uh, watch, watch this. So if I go over here, I think I have an app. Um, oh, here's my, my one little app. So I can come over here to the design, and I can say, I would like, let's see, there's this uh, little thing I threw up here, number of executions. There's a button. If I double-click the button, here's Python. It actually takes that code and compiles it to JavaScript and runs it on Sculpt in the browser. And you can like import requests or like here, import random. And so you don't, there may be a point in time where you don't have to, oh, I got to work. I'm trying to cycle some car images. So yeah, maybe someday we can just write Python and it'll still run in the browser, but uh, that's not entirely going to work right now. <laughs> what else? Any 
hey, I, I think you You've reached silence here. All right, perfect. So let me give you guys two takeaway things. One, if you check out TalkPython, which actually showed you a little bit of the code for this site here, um, I have, as of today, 137 episodes, interview a bunch of people, all sorts of stuff on there. So uh, if you want to hear experts talk about Python, subscribe to the podcast. I also have a course on this topic. If you just click courses at the top, there's a write Python at code somewhere course, like a four and a half hour version of this. So those are interesting to you, check them out. If not, thanks for the questions and for attending.